The Unshackled Waves, episode 104. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was a week of further policy and political instability in Australia, well at the federal level at least. We also saw the Queensland election result with Labor looking likely that they will scrape just back in with a bare majority. Thank you to those who watched our live stream. We will digest the rest of the week's news with Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back again. Yeah, ghetto Tim, it was only last night that we were talking about the Queensland election, which is just riveting going through the preferences of uh, seats around the state of Queensland. But uh, that's all over and done with now, although it's still undecided in the state of Queensland. But we've got plenty of things to talk about, of course, Tim. Uh, banking Royal Commission, potentially, or an inquiry. Uh, there's Manus Island. Uh, there's a disaster of Kevin Rudd. And uh, I think there's a few more things to think about. Uh, yes, there's uh, also and to the, talk about if... the Benelog by-election, which is it's going to be a, a close contest. Uh, uh, but both of us tonight were a bit under the weather because we put in such a, a long shift uh, last night, but uh, the, the show must go on. Well, the show must go on, and Vegas never sleeps. So we follow the same mantra here. We've just got to put out the news. I uh, hope you watch it and we hope you enjoy it. And we're just here to give a, a truthful and insightful uh, kind of breakdown of the news and uh, trying to break down uh, the chains of control. That's really our, our mantra and our mission here at The Unshackled is to give you a, a, an agenda free, largely, uh, an independent kind of view on the news. So we're hoping we can do that. Uh, federal politics is still a mess at the moment. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, even though, uh, in my opinion, he had his uh, uh, big, uh, well, he had a good week last week with the result of the marriage postal survey going his way, and uh, he was on the, the winning side of that, but he managed to uh, uh, stuff things up again this week, and uh, adds back to the, the normal uh, chaos. And... Uh, in response to uh, the se uh, same-sex marriage, how it's not looking like there'll be many uh, religious protections, uh, some national MPs are threatening to uh, cross the floor and vote with Labor to establish a, a banking royal commission, which is easier since uh, the coalition are now two seats down in the House of Representatives due to by-elections. So uh, they've lost their majority on the on the floor of Parliament. Now, it, it resulted in uh, Malcolm Turnbull and uh, Christopher Pine taking the unprecedented step to suspend the, the House of Representatives for one week. It was supposed to sit uh, this uh, this following week. Um, uh, apparently, the, the reason that was given is so that the Senate could pass the uh, uh, same-sex marriage bill, and so the following week it would be ready for uh, the House. So it was apparently to give the Senate more time, though I don't get how making less sitting days, how, the, how that actually gives the parliament more time unless are we meant to believe that the the house is just there to deal with same-sex marriage and nothing else well you'd hope not tim we've got plenty of other concerns in society at large uh we would hope that same-sex marriage isn't the most important issue in the nation i'm sure you could agree with that uh but certainly i think this is showing really uh and Ross Cameron put this perfectly on Sky News the other night, that the government is really uh, lost for options. Malcolm Turnbull is very much scaling on thin ice here. And that, that is why the, um, the uh, Christopher Pine, uh, what a, a great man with some uh, quirky interests, may I add, uh, called uh, you know, a recess, I guess, on, on government activities for a while. But... Um, it certainly, if not anything, doesn't really show the government's willingness to 
while deal with same-sex marriage or the citizenship saga as they market it, but it certainly shows that they are hot under the pump. Uh, this, don't want to be talking about Christopher Pine and hot under the pump, but, but certainly they, they are really you know in trouble here and this is a last resort option for them. And it got even worse later in the week when there was a damaging uh, cabinet leak which uh, revealed uh, divisions over whether they should uh, backflip on their opposition to a banking royal commission. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Peter Dutton, they were open to the idea, while uh, Treasurer Scott Morrison, uh, he uh, believed that the government should stand firm in its uh, uh, opposition. But uh, when the, the ca uh, there's a leak from the cabinet, that's a sign that a government is on uh, death row. I remember uh, in the weeks leading up to uh, Tony Abbott's uh, de uh, being deposed as Prime Minister, there are a number of damaging uh, cabinet leaks. And a lot of people have uh, pointed the, the finger at uh, Julie Bishop because she was the, the only one who uh, came out of this leak unscathed, or should I say potential uh, leadership aspirant. And uh, I've it's, it's interesting to, uh, to me, it, uh, I've concluded it could be the same person who is leaking now that was in, in 2015. I think that is the case. We have seen uh, Miss Bishop uh, behind Brendan Nelson. We have seen Miss Bishop behind Tony Abbott. And we have seen Miss Bishop behind now, uh, probably soon to be former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. So she uh, seems to be playing the long game here, or as um, some describe it, the Frank Underwood from House of Cards. So uh, maybe she's a Machiavellian kind of uh, dark character we don't hear or see much about, but I'm sure that she's quietly plotting away for some kind of leadership position. Now, Peter Credlin and the Herald Sons also mentioned this, uh, Andrew Bold as well, that if she doesn't get the Prime Ministership, she'll probably go to a, a, a champagne um, a sipping diplomatic role uh, somewhere around the world. But I certainly do think that Julie Bishop is guilty for a lot of the uh, instability that has occurred within the government. And uh, it appears that she does have the kind of the factional heavyweights behind her in being able to depose uh, uh, party leaders and prime ministers. Uh, dare I say, it got even worse for Malcolm Turnbull when it was an unnamed coalition uh, MP told Andrew Bolt they will uh, quit the, the coalition unless Turnbull uh, is replaced, and they said that Julie Bishop wouldn't be an acceptable uh, alternative and that Turnbull must be replaced by uh, a, cons a conservative or somebody who can appeal to a conservative. So that, so that brings a, uh, another uh, fr uh, fresh round of uh, instability. Now, I have a, a fair idea of who this uh, unnamed MP is. I'm not going to say uh, on, on this show, um, but it, yes, it just adds to, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, after his, you know, good week last week, it's, he, he, his, his prime ministership is hanging by a thread yet again, and most commentators are now uh, believing that it's only a matter of time before he's replaced. So this unnamed source that, uh, that uh, Andrew Bolt on the Bolt Report, I believe, near, near a week ago, refused to name. Does his surname, Tim, happen to begin with H? Surname happened to begin with H? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so that rules out Hawk and Hasty as the Conservatives that, that may uh, wander to. Now, you know, that, that begs the question that uh, we, we all presume that the moderate faction is a party, uh, is the, the faction that's in charge of the Liberal Party. Obviously, with the, earlier this year, we saw Christopher Pine gloating over the matter, uh, you know, laughing about same-sex marriage. And then you saw Tim Wilson and his buddy in the Senate kind of sneering at Cory Bernardi after the same-sex marriage bill was passed. Um, so I definitely think that the moderate faction is in charge. And what's happening is the the conservative faction within the Liberal Party uh, are somewhat kind of jealous or angry that they lost uh, the power uh, where, where, when Tony Abbott was deposed. Uh, so I th certainly do think, but on, on talking on Tony Abbott, 
Tony Abbott's former advisor, Peter Credlin, uh, made a fantastic point in the Daily Telegraph uh, and the, I think it was in the Herald Sun as well, uh, on the parallels of Malcolm Turnbull and uh, Kevin Rudd, that they both kind of, they've both kind of got big and broad ideas. They're both fabulous orators. They have both got terrible uh, temperaments, uh, and they also have a real uh, challenge communicating to the people. In other words, they're elites who are disconnected. Uh, they've got massive uh, personality flaws that are kind of covered up by a great kind of charisma, a, a great kind of confidence, and they both really love the sound of their own voices. Now, you know, an argument could be made that some of these um, kind of personality traits are almost sociopathic, that they, in a sense, both men have, the you know, struggle to uh, understand uh, the party and the people and it's, it's Kevin or it's uh, Malcolm, and it's not the country. And I think that's the parallel between uh, these two men. And But uh, I think they were both catalysts for their kind of, their behavior, uh, their temperaments, uh, just the way they are. Uh, these kind of destructive, uh, borderline sociopathic people, I believe they are anyway, uh, really caused havoc and wrecked both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, and I don't mean sociopathic in the Dexter sense. What I mean is, in a sense, very hard to relate to people, you know, completely uh, driven by goals, very cold, you know, not very easy to relate to, but has a kind of a, an apparent charm or charisma to them on the outside that makes them votable or appealable. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much my breakdown there, Tim. Why don't we have a look at the issue that's caused this uh, fresh round of uh, leadership instability, which is the government trying to avoid a banking royal commission uh, being established. Now, uh, is it, you know, do they need to avoid this royal commission at all costs? Uh, but it was interesting, John Howard's intervention uh, later this week when he called uh, uh, the uh, calls for a banking royal commission uh, rank uh, socialism. Now, obviously, the banks, you know, they they've been involved in a lot of a lot of uh, you know dodgy uh, financial uh, advice. There's been you know uh, already uh, parliamentary inquiries. Royal commissions, uh, in my point of view, they're 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 pretty toothless. Like they, you know, they drag they drag people before them. You know, lay out, um, you know, a whole bunch of you know dirty, dirty laundry. But they actually, you know, they they have their findings, and you know that's it. So it, it's going to be an embarrassment for the government if it's uh, established. But I've I, I don't see it being the the end of the world. Well, Tim, we did, we saw the um. The John Dale uh, Royal Commission earlier on this year, and what what came out of that? That we need to raise the criminal age, you know, to twelve, and that we need some, we need to move kids out of, you know, whatever, get them out of the uh, the conditions that we're in. You could have picked up a copy of the Australian. You could have picked up a copy of the Age or any uh, any newspaper, and uh, you know, discovered uh, through reading an opinion piece. Uh, those uh, very easy uh, things to figure out. Uh, here you look, that Royal Commission cost $50 million. Now, we always say $50 million. Well, $50 million in the scheme of things uh, is uh, a lot of money. Uh, $50 million that could have been, you know, invested uh, into infrastructure. We were talking about Queensland last night. $50 million could have, you know, gone... Uh, you know, into stimulating a uh, dam project or something in Queensland, you know, that could have been a great, of a great benefit. Instead, we spent $50 million on the Dondale Royal Commission to tell us that the criminal age in the Northern Territory or the criminal age where you can be prosecuted, what have you, needs to be raised by two years. Now, I think anyone could have, could have pointed that out. It was a great uh, deal of a waste of money. Um, I don't think a Senate hearing has done much. Uh, Malcolm Roberts chaired one of those earlier this year into banking. That didn't really uh, seem to have much. Uh, but there, 
I think there should be an inquiry and not a commission because I think a commission uh, is a waste of money. Uh, and it, all it does really is it's a bit like getting the special prosecutor out when Kenneth Starr uh, did all his business in the US when Bill Clinton was accused of, of sexual misconduct. It's just airing unnecessary dirty laundry that may not necessarily be related to the issues at hand and uh, that will, I think, just be a massive waste of money and it will cause a great deal of uh, speculation as to whether, you know, the Australian uh, banking sector is strong. You know, it will cause a great havoc to share prices, thus affecting people's superannuations quite substantially. Uh, and, and also, uh, you were talking of John Howard. Uh, he called it ranked socialism because obviously, uh, we were talking this off there, Tim, uh, Ben Shifley tried to nationalise Australia's banks. I also see this Royal Commission uh, eventually uh, becoming a way to uh, regulate uh, and interfere uh, with the banking sector uh, to such an inordinate scale uh, that you had a, a, a you know a, a subprime mortgage crisis like you had in the US or you have a of a Greek issue. I just think that that meddling in the banking sector to make it more fair uh, really just has a a, a, a marvelous uh, chance, or well, not marvellous, it's not great, but it's sorry, substantial chance of, you know, creating havoc in the financial system, uh, regulating it. Uh, Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, I believe in the US, was that was a subprime mortgage, uh, wanting to uh, give, give more housing loans to African Americans. Um, uh, so I think the Royal Commission will just end up in more regulation and more havoc. Uh, it will just be a complete waste of money and it won't really uncover much besides dirty laundry that is completely unrelated uh, to the issues that face everyday Australians. It may not be the Banking Royal Commission that uh, undoes Turnbull or the uh, result of the Queensland state election, but it could be the uh, Benelog by-election, which is being held on Saturday, the uh, 16th of December, uh, which was uh, triggered by the fact that uh, the sitting Liberal MP, uh, John Alexander, uh, discovered that he was a uh, dual uh, British citizen on account of his father. Now, uh, Benelog, he's, he, he's got a uh, healthy uh, margin there of around 9 uh, or 10%, but we have to remember that uh, that was the seat that uh, it used to be John Howard's seat, which he lost in 2007 uh, to, to Maxine McHugh. So Labor, uh, they, they can win it, and they've uh, ro uh, rolled out a, another star candidate. I don't know what it is about Benelog and uh, the ALP uh, rolling out star candidates because they've got a uh, another uh, TV presenter but also former New South Wales Premier in uh, Christina Keneally as their uh, candidate. Now she was uh, the Premier at the end of the uh, well, pretty much sum it up as you know, the corrupt New South Wales uh, state Labor government years but despite all of this baggage uh, polling puts it at 50-50 uh, and the, this, uh, the result of this by-election could determine the, the fate of uh, both the Turnbull government and Turnbull himself. The, you, we had an argument uh, last night, Tim, about the importance of the state election. Uh, Stephen Cable and I uh, tended to agree with one another that it didn't really have much implication. Although I think that anyone who is relatively in tune with the Australian political landscape can realise the importance of Benelong. Uh, Benelong was the seat of John Howard. Uh, Benelong, you know, uh, is, I guess, maybe the crown uh, in the jewel of, of the Liberal Party in Sydney uh, to a great extent. But John Alexander um, is, under, is uh, under some substantial strain uh, here uh, Christina Keneally is a, a, a clean, polished and energetic figure with a great TV experience. High heels, a red dress, she's pretty, she's easy to listen to and she pretends to care about people. So, you know, it is rather appealing to, I guess, many voters. Uh, although one has to remember her connection. She, the reason why she was Premier is essentially she was appointed by Eddie O'Bead and uh, his cronies. Uh, 
She was was very obedient. Yes, haha, that's good. But yeah, she was basically a pawn, uh, you know, in the corruption. She was, uh, I don't really know if she, she, one way or another she is to blame, either through being ignorant of the corruption that happened uh, or or being complicit. Uh, So I, I think that that's one issue there. Another spanner in the works of the Ben Along by election is John Alexander's um, domestic violence joke, but that was from 20 years ago, 22 years ago, uh, that was probably in the Labor archives for a rainy day, uh, and that's been pulled out, and that showed him making a joke. I doubt that would make too much of a difference. Um, you said nine point healthy margin. I think it would be close, but this certainly at the end of the day is a referendum. On Malcolm Turnbull, uh, but if Benelong's won, uh, the the so-called anonymous sources that are on the Bolt report, talking to Andrew Bolt, sorry, uh, will be silenced. And it's not a good sign when, like, obviously the the domestic violence joke uh, came out when a whole string of things start to go wrong. It's not a good omen because there was also that. Uh, 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 campaign uh, photo that John Alexander's uh, campaign uh, released of him with his staff in his uh, campaign office uh, phoning up uh, constituents, uh, though everyone was quick to point out that the phones were not plugged in. Yes, <laughs> well, that, that really shows uh, the Liberal Party in a sense. Uh, they're holding the telephone, pretending to talk to the people. Uh, it's all phony, uh, but the phones aren't plugged in at the other end. I think it's just a great representation of, of where the Australian Liberal Party is at the moment. Uh, you know, a party that was once great under Menzies and Howard's has seemed to lose its way a little bit over the last couple of years. I hope it turns good again, but at the moment it is a little bit of a disaster under Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, you, but uh, for, sorry, one more thing. Christina Keneally should not talk about phones or uh, broadband or anything related because we cannot forget the disaster of Kevin Rudd and the MBN uh, 10 years ago that has left us with slower internet speeds in Kenya. And uh, Bill Shorten, he's, uh, I think uh, he's been there perhaps three times already in uh, Bandalog. So uh, Christina Keneally, is, you know, she is uh, eager to appear b- uh, beside uh, Bill Shorten. And everyone was asking, you know, where's Malcolm Turnbull in uh, Bandalog? Well, he did show up uh, today, this Sunday, and it actually went surprisingly well for him. He was mobbed with a request for uh, selfies. So, you know, out on the street, he's, you know, he's not the, uh, you know, pr- uh, pariah, town pariah yet. I remember in Julia Gillard's dying days as Prime Minister, she, if she was ever out in public, you know, she would get, you know, heckled. Uh, when she went to school, she got sandwiches thrown at her. So uh, I, I don't think that there's, you know, this huge, um, you know, hatred for, for Malcolm Turnbull. That I think maybe the voters feel uh, a, bit, a, bit, a bit sorry for him, but <laughs> that, that's still not good. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, two things that I really think signify the the fall of the coalition at the moment. One being Malcolm Turnbull could not name an ACDC song, and two, John Alexander didn't have the phones plugged in. Now you might think that these are very very small things, but they signify one that they are disconnected with the Australian people, literally, and two. You know that that they're not on the same wavelength as the Australian people, uh, quite literally. Again, I doubt that Malcolm Turnbull would listen to Triple M or uh, watch Fox Footy or would have pies with the boys. Uh, that he seems to be a bit out of touch, but he seems to be likable. He is not getting heckled, uh, which is a good sign. But I think that this, I think that Malcolm uh, is walking on a tightrope at the moment. And when he falls off that tightrope, uh, I guarantee you there won't be cushions or people there to catch him. There will be crocodiles uh, swimming around in circles, sharks swimming around in circles, willing and wanting uh, to eat him up. 
um, anterior just shreds. So it's just one mistake or one gush of populism uh, to knock Malcolm Turnbull off that tentative tightrope that he walks uh, that will be the fall of his government. And I, all I can say to anyone is, is God help us all if uh, Bill Shorten uh, walks into Kirribilli House in the next uh, 12 to 18 months whenever the next election happens. The Manus Island standoff came to a head this week. The 400 uh, men who were at the uh, former Manus Island detention centre who've been refusing to leave the Papua New Guinea authorities came to, um, and I'll use the expression, physically remove them uh, because they're uh, contrary to you know what they're claiming. There is a, a brand new uh, $10 million facility built by the Australian government that is ready for, for them to uh, move into. But obviously, uh, this uh, closure of the the centre is uh, they're they're trying them and uh, their advocates back in Australia are trying to use this as uh, another opportunity to put pressure on the government to cave in, uh, you know, cause a, a confrontation, get the international media saying, you know, look how horrible Australia's being being to these uh, uh, asylum seekers, uh, and of course in Australia for three weeks now, uh, refugee advocates have been staging uh, protests in uh, major cities they've been occupying, uh, immigration offices, and uh, what I found the most despicable of all was uh, on Melbourne Cup Day, they drove a, a car onto the Flemington Racecourse to stop uh, uh, race, uh, race goers uh, atten attending the, the Cup because uh, in their opinion, they wanted to punish race goers for their alleged uh, uh, complicity in uh, Australia's uh, uh, border protection uh, policies, which I've always found is like, wow, that's like a great way to convince people of your uh, position, just, you know, piss them off, you know, uh, them going about their daily business. Uh, there are two types of people in this world. Uh, people who uh, want to be left the hell alone and people who won't leave people the hell alone. These loon bag nutters, um, these crazy idiots uh, who don't realise uh, the complete significance of the wondrous work of the government on this issue are letting us all down. They are really damaging our great reputation uh, in the eyes of of the media across the globe for their own petty political games. They really need to be reined in. Uh, and if these protests continue, quite frankly, uh, if they are disrupting the government uh, functioning properly, uh, if they are sitting in uh, government offices and, uh, and acting unlawfully, uh, these protests must be stopped. I do respect their right to freedom of speech if they are compliant with the law. If they aren't inhibiting you know, other people's uh, ability to practice their own jobs, that is fine with me. But what these idiots don't realise uh, is that the people in Manus Island have essentially been moved from a, a temporary hostel with education, air conditioning, great food, to essentially a three or a four star hotel uh, and they've been given jobs and opportunities, but still somehow to these morons, this is still a violation of human rights. Now, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. And a lot of the uh, information about the uh, standoff is being uh, relayed into Australia by this uh, uh, well, he's a, he's a journalist, uh, uh, but he's being held at the uh, detention centre from, uh, he's from Iran, I, I'm not going to att attempt to pronounce his name, but, you know, we're, we're told that they're, you know, they're living in squalor, like they're in makeshift shelters, yet they're able to, you know, tweet out what is happening, they're able to, you know, write op-eds for The Guardian, I mean, you know, if you've got access to modern technology, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think you're living in the, you know, squalor that you claim you are. Well, so there are some great developments happening at the moment. One of them is 3D printing. and One of them is the legalisation of euthanasia in Victoria. Now, I encourage, no, I can't encourage uh, uh, writers of The Guardian to do that. I might get myself in trouble. But 
what what happens is essentially these uh, loon bags uh, hijack these poor and innocent people uh, for their own political gains. I don't think they care about these people. Uh, I really do think the Australian government and the Australian people do care about these people, and that's why we have said to them uh, that you know we can't have you in the country, but we can give you opportunities. We we love and we care for you, but we don't want more of your comrades. Uh, more of you, of your buddies to be uh, to drown at sea. One of the most traumatic things that I ever saw uh, was that boat hitting the rocks on Christmas Island. I saw that on the ABC on a shaky handheld device. The box, uh, the boat, you know, hitting the rocks at Christmas Island. Uh, people going overboard and drowning. Um, I don't want to see any more of that. But I want to see these people dealt with humanely uh, and, and dealt with well. And I think that's what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're talking about, you know, how horrible it is that these men are, you know, being f physically removed, dragged. Well, the reason why that's happening is because, you know, these refugee advocates have instructed these men to, you know, stay because, you know, oh, if you just do this, you know, you'll be guaranteed to, uh, you know, be let into Australia. So they could have, you know, three weeks ago, they could have been at these new facilities. Now they claim, you know, they aren't ready or, you know, they haven't got access to, you know, electricity or anything like that but we've seen photos of the facilities they look they look pretty good uh, in in my opinion I mean they, they, they could have you know just you know been you know quite have uh, quite comfortable in this new center but you know they uh, refugee because they put a thought in their mind that if you you know just subject yourself to you know this uh, 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 this type of stunt, then it will, you know, we'll, we'll definitely uh, achieve our, our policy goal. Okay, I've got two questions for you, Tim. Uh, if you were travelling uh, by foot, uh, you were tired, uh, you, you had to go to sleep somewhere, uh, would you sleep at the new uh, facility that's been built by the Australian government? Would you deem that to be comfortable accommodation for you? Oh well, it looks uh, it looks like a you know decent hotel room. I mean, when the I, I saw when those uh, photos were posted, I saw a lot of comments saying, "Wow, you know, uh, I think a lot of Australians would you know love to have facilities like that." And you know that's the old cliche that might be dropped out, but I do think that there are good facilities there. Uh, there's a deal in the in the works with the United States. Uh, there's jobs there. Uh, they're now legally, I believe, uh, PNG's uh, issue, uh, and they're in another sovereign country. The issue has been dealt with. Uh, they've got new facilities, and I encourage them to move to these new facilities that have been built on the uh, backs of uh, hard paid for taxpayer dollars. And the other thing that, that I would probably think might be the case is they might even have faster internet speeds than you and I at the moment, Tim. <laughs> oh, who knows if they're pumping out all those tweets and uh, op-ed pieces. Uh, but you know, it seems the strategy of these uh, refugee advocates back home is to just cause as much disruption in it as possible in the hope that, you know, the government will just be intimidated to uh, reverse their position. But... Uh, to give the government credit on uh, border protection, they know that they have to be 100% firm that any sign of weakness will, will see the, the people smugglers return. And it was interesting that uh, in the wake of Jacinta Ardern's uh, offer to take 150 of the men at Ma Manus, there were actually a few asylum seeker boats that were sent New Zealand's way that were stopped uh, by, by Australian authorities. So that that is how easy it is to start up this uh, people smuggling uh, trade again. And also the government knows that the Australian people are on their side. I mean, one of the reasons why Tony Abbott won the 2013 election was on the platform of stopping the boats. So it is, it, it is a widely supported uh, po policy position of uh, uh, that the left can, you know, carry on all they want, but uh, it's it's one of those things where the silent majority, the the people who vote in numbers, you know, they're they're happy with the government's position. Well, largely, uh, Malcolm Turnbull has uh, carried uh, the torch here uh, of of I guess truth. 
sometimes truth is hard to swallow, but at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is what the government are doing uh, is to the benefit of these people. They're stopping people drowning at sea. They're stopping the profiteering of trafficking human beings. Um, and they're just taking the moral stand. And what many forget, especially on the radical left, is that Australia has the basically the highest intake per capita of uh, refugees on humanitarian grounds around the world. Uh, we do our fair share. We give plenty in foreign aid. Uh, we've contributed to peacekeeping missions uh, in the in the uh, East Timor. We we do plenty for uh, humanitarian reasons. Um, and to call us uh, to call us inhumane uh, to say that we breach human rights when we care, when we're doing our best to protect our borders, but also to protect these people from thugs and criminals who want to take advantage of our lives. I take personal offence to that. There was an anniversary this week. It was the 10-year uh, uh, anniversary of the election of the Rudd Labor government in 2007, which was also the defeat of the uh, Howard uh, government, which had been in power since uh, 1996. And it, it really was the beginning of you know, the decline of Australia uh, over the over the ne ne next ten years, uh, I mean, and we, uh, Rudd basically sold himself, uh, so, sold the Australian people a lie. He said that you know he was a you know fiscal conservative, uh, you know that he'd be uh, the person to carry on the baton from John Howard. Uh, but the signs were uh, there early that you know he were he was going to you know really uh, you know sh shake things up. He was making you know bold promises with the. Know, the NBN, we were going to have the fastest internet uh, in the world. Then there was the uh, education uh, revolution, uh, which to start off with, he would give uh, every high school student uh, a laptop. Then there was, you know, he was going to sign the Kyoto Protocol, uh, introduce an emissions trading scheme, invest in uh, renewable energy, you know, and this was going to be the, he was going to be the person to, you know, take Australia to the, the next step of greatness. And uh, the Australian people, unfortunately, they you know believed his rhetoric and voted for him. And, and ten years later, even though the the Rudd Gillard years, as it turned out, are long gone, you know their legacy is is still with us to this day. Their legacy of uh, turmoil, of chaos and destruction is still with us today. Uh, we can never forget the havoc that that John uh, that sorry that that was ruined John Howard's legacy being ruined by Kevin Rudd. We can never forget, but we've also seen this done before by Labor prime ministers. Let's not forget. After the Menzies era, uh, a fellow by the name of Gough Whitlam uh, got in charge of Australia and really ruined the country. Uh, borrowing money from shady Pakistani businessmen, uh, you know, basic economic stagnation, the works. So pretty much, and this is no uh, effort of hyperbole, every time uh, Labor gets in charge after a golden era, they seem to burn the house down and, uh, you know, destroy everything. Now, uh, Ch uh, Chesterton, a, a great Catholic thinker, said uh, that there is no point of you know, tearing down a fence if you don't know why it was put there. And what happened was Kevin Rudd tore down that fence and he did not know why it was put there. You know, he, he tore down the layers of uh, prosperity, of growth, of faith, of family, of community, of country uh, that were so great in that time. Uh, he completely ruined this country. Uh, he also set the precedent, I believe, for one-term governments across this country. Uh, we saw uh, through him, we saw a hung parliament uh, and uh, we saw, uh, you know, a great period of instability where the Senate was basically controlling uh, all the activities of parliament and nothing was happening. Um, also, also, Kevin Rudd, uh, we can never forget, I babble on about this, the NBN uh, was a complete disaster. The economic stimulus package wrote off the future fund created by John Howard and Peter Costello, completely erased. Uh, you, we cannot forget 
uh, Kevin Rudd, you know, basically put this country into a mountain of debt when it had a huge, huge surplus. We cannot forget. And we cannot forget that Kevin Rudd, you know, allowed thousands upon thousands of children to drown at sea and, you know, millions of dollars to be made uh, through profiteering of uh, people smugglers. Kevin Rudd was a complete disaster. Uh, and it's also, you mentioned the, the ins, instability and chaos. Since uh, John Howard in 2007, we haven't had a Prime Minister able to serve out a full term. Rudd got cut down in uh, 2010, then Gillard uh, before the 2013 election, Labor went back to Rudd. Then, of course, the, the Liberal Party ended up doing the same thing. They um, uh, tore down a first-term Prime Minister in Tony Abbott, and now uh, Malcolm Turnbull doesn't look like he's going to, to make it uh, th uh, through this term as well. So we have the, we've had the you know, revolving door of uh, Prime Ministers. It was, it was funny uh, uh, back when John Howard was the Prime Minister, the, the old joke was, you know, it seems like he's going to be Prime Minister forever. Now, now we, you know, we, uh, we, we can't even stick with a Prime Minister uh, for a full term. But you're right that the NBN has been a you know, complete disaster. We know what the NBN is, has done firsthand. Uh, if you watched our live stream last night, you would have known that uh, our stream was cut off at one point and immigration that, well, as we mentioned in our previous discussion, the, the reason why those men are at Manus Island is thanks to, you know, Rudd uh, getting rid of the, the Howard government's strong border protection policy. But also the, uh, the other major um, policy blunder from the Rudd era that we're still uh, paying for is uh, energy. Uh, we're literally paying for it. We're paying, you know, the highest electricity prices in the world and we're not even getting reliable uh, electricity. I mean, uh, in a, here in Victoria, they're, they're already saying that there's a strain on the grid and we haven't even hit peak uh, summer yet. I can still see heat, so I know that the power hasn't gone out. Okay. <laughs> I was just testing there. Uh, well, Ah, whoops, I stuffed that one up. Uh, well, power is inordinately expensive and it is extremely unfortunate uh, what Kevin Rudd has done here. John Howard had the peace of mind not to sign the Kyoto Protocol because India and China did not sign. Therefore, uh, John, sorry, John Howard um, said, you know, we're not going to sign uh, you know, he, he took the common stand approach um, and he did what was right for the nation. We haven't seen a stand-up guy like John Winston Howard uh, since. Uh, but, the, but the ultimate uh, thing here is the fact that these high power prices uh, that were created uh, through the vast regulation of the energy network uh, that, of course, has been blamed on the marketplace from price gouging, uh, are just a temerity on these lefties. Um, you know, it was created, obviously, by all that. And what that does is creates a massive, massive strain on manufacturing. Uh, the very people that the Labor Party pretends to uh, uh, represent, uh, they've done thousands of thousands of employees out of manufacturing jobs, out of blue-collar jobs out of small business jobs. This has been a disastrous decision for workers, uh, for business owners and for families. It's been very costly to our nation. And we haven't even mentioned the uh, budget situation. I mean, John Howard left a, and Peter Costello left a budget surplus. And uh, now uh, we've had deficits uh, every year. Our debt is now, uh, federal debt is now close to uh, $600 billion. Uh, we're promised a budget surplus in uh, 2021, but who knows if we'll, we'll, we'll actually get there. And, and meanwhile, there's, you know, the government programs, uh, you know, social security, uh, health spending. Uh, let, let's not forget that education funding. Don't forget that uh, Gillard in a dying days knocked us, locked us into uh, uh, Gonski uh, funding, even though uh, we've increased funding in education and our standards are slipping. So uh, 
you know, the, sp the spending is, uh, is continuing to go up, the debt's continuing to go up, and of course the, uh, the ta uh, tax rate, I mean, uh, per personal income taxes are still uh, close to, you know, 50% uh, for the top marginal rate. Yep, and another thing that Gillard did was uh, taking off the cap placing in universities. So there have been a flooding of fully Commonwealth supported uh, university placements uh, through people who were stupid, who are flooding the system. And the thing is, because the market itself uh, was completely, you know, it was regulated as to it will allow 1,500 people into this course if there's X amount of jobs. Uh, there is none of that anymore. So that is a problem because it's a there's still that element of regulation into it. Um, but it's just allowed government to to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it was it was good when less people could get in, I believe, uh, because you know only the brightest and the smartest went to university. Now even a bachelor's degree is worth nothing. You know, after what Gillard did there, uh, and the economic stimulus package. You, you, I don't believe you mentioned that, Tim. That is uh, what drove the nation into debt. They were spending every school got a new gym. Every school seemed to get a new library, and there were heaps of fraud, waste, and abuse uh, through unions uh, just gouging off the contracts there. And let's not forget uh, the yeah. uh, Pink Bats uh, disaster there, uh, f which caused uh, the death of uh, four uh, electricians and caused uh, 200 uh, house fires. So uh, uh, the, uh, it actually, you know, uh, the stimulus package, it actually, you know, caused actual destruction and death. Well, when I said carnage, you might have thought it was a bit hyperbolic, but we're, we're being serious here. The Labor Party left behind carnage. Dead electrici electricians, dead kids, slower internet, high debt, a nation crumbling at its foundations. We can all thank that. Uh, we can all thank Kevin Rudd for that. Uh, so uh, we, we definitely uh, on this show today we we traced back uh, most of the the problems we discuss on uh, this show back to its uh, source, which yes, uh, it, it wasn't. Uh, so, some people were saying it uh, it was a, a celebration, but uh, for us it's definitely a commiseration. Ten years on from Rudd's election victory, and I just hope that you know the Australian people uh, they've learnt. From this, I hope, and uh, you know, future elections, they they aren't taken in by you know the same bold promises and you know the 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 same uh, uh, sales pitch, and you know we, we we don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Well, the sign of insanity is repeating the same mistakes over and over again. and the Australian voting base is doing that at the moment. We are insane if we are to vote for this same uh, chaos and dysfunction once again. Well, we got through the show, I think, uh, reasonably well, despite uh, both of us uh, being quite exhausted uh, from last night. So thank you once again, Jacob, for, for joining me. Yeah, no worries, Tim. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. This was recorded on a Sunday evening, so... Assuming that it will be coming out on Monday or Tuesday. So I'm um, hoping that you all enjoy your weeks. Stay in tune with us. Uh, send us a message. Uh, we're interested to hear back from you. Uh, and we hope you'll join us next week. See you later. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. We haven't got any events lined up in the near future, but we'll be focusing our energies on increasing our output. So we hope to bring you more important news and commentary about what is really going on in Australia and around the world on the important battles. So make sure you keep checking out the Unshackled as there is always something new posted there. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.